September 2000, off the southern coast of France. Salvage teams search for a downed World War II plane. What they find, 60 meters down, is unexpected. Ancient amphoras, pottery containers of a type rarely recovered from the sea before. Their surprising discovery triggers an investigation that throws new light on Western Europe's first great civilization. A sophisticated society centuries before the Romans. Skilled workers in ceramics, craftsmen in bronze, artists in gold experts in the production of wine, the Etruscans, a race that vanished into obscurity. The old stone fort that guards the port of Marseille harbors many treasures recovered from the Mediterranean. As Luc Long, the curator, makes his way to his office this September morning, a video cassette from the leader of the salvage team awaits him. Little does Luc realize that the underwater footage is about to draw him into a long-term archaeological adventure a full-scale inquiry into a vanished race. Hey, Michel. Luke seeks confirmation from his colleague that the tape he's received from the divers shows remains that are truly Etruscan. There are 60 to 70 amphoras, indeed Etruscan and all of the same design. Knowledge of the Etruscans is all too scarce, yet they were perhaps the true founders of European culture. In the 7th century BC, Egypt, Asia Minor and Greece ruled over the eastern shores of the Mediterranean. In the west, small tribal groups lived in antiquated villages. All that is with one notable exception, a unique civilization flourishing on the western edge of Italy. Today Etruria is known as Tuscany. Here, wealthy through minerals and agriculture, the Etruscans were developing a highly original way of life. For more than five centuries, these lords of the sea were vital middlemen between east and west, only to disappear from history. One major problem with Etruscan culture is a very big lacuna, a very big gap, and that is that although the Etruscans were literate, and in fact we have thousands of inscriptions from Etruria, what they didn't seem to write was any connected history about themselves in the way that we have Roman history written by Roman historians, Greek history written by many Greek historians. The Etruscans seem to confine their writing more to matters to do with religion and because we don't have that information, the, the very memory of the Etruscans as a nation has tended to fade after the Roman conquest. Anything that sheds light on them would be a valued prize, well worth an expedition. One month after the discovery of the site on the Côte d'Azur, an underwater salvage vessel, complete with submersible, sets out towards the west of the small island of Grand Ribot. The amphoras were found just off its coast. The managing director of the salvage company, Henri Deloze, had made the initial discovery. 
He's passionate about underwater archaeology, and he's giving Luc Long a brief loan of the equipment needed for a preliminary investigation. The crew prepare the submersible for Luc's first descent. Luke can only hope the submersible doesn't leak. Luke is astonished to see ten amphoras in a single square meter. Amphoras, pottery vessels with a narrow neck and two handles, were the all-purpose containers of the ancient world. If Luke can recover them, they may offer clues to the mystery of their makers. The first challenge is to free the amphoras from the grasp of the mud and weed, using an enormous fan known as the blaster. The commercial diving equipment is only on loan to Luke for two weeks. He doesn't have long to make his initial survey. The crew decide to sweep over the wreck at two and a half meters and map the area in three passes. Luke takes the opportunity to test a new approach, a robot. The amphoras lie 60 meters down, the limit for ordinary divers. If the robot works here, researchers will be able to explore depths beyond the reach of the Mediterranean's many underwater looters. The amphoras are spread out over an area a little smaller than a tennis singles court. The archaeologists assume that like other ancient vessels discovered in the Mediterranean, the boat would have been a small craft, about nine meters long. But what Henri Delos observes on his dive leads him to reject this idea. When Luke asks him about his dive, Henri insists that the find is much bigger than the remote pictures make it appear. Henri thinks the amphoras are still upright in sand and mud, one layer still as they were loaded. What Luke hears delights him. This would be the first time a big cargo has been found. And they can forget the idea that it was a small boat. They're looking at a big cargo vessel. If the boat does prove to be a big one, it will be a truly extraordinary discovery. Although Greek texts insist that the Etruscans were great navigators, there are very few illustrations or images giving any idea of the design of their ships or the size of their cargoes. After several precious days preparation of the site, the archaeologists are at last ready to take to the water in force. They'll go down for a good 10 minutes, all they can risk at that depth. Luke is concerned that the finds be properly documented and marked. It's the first time that a boatload of the same type of amphoras has been found. Until now, Scholars have assumed that only small boats carrying mixed loads plied the coast. 
no complete Etruscan vessel has ever been found, and no cargo all of the same contents. As all-purpose containers, the amphoras might have held grain, oil, or olives. The first results are encouraging. Luke quickly sees that the amphoras are all of a similar design. The potter was adept at producing a standard model. He tells the others that the containers are of a type appearing at the end of the 6th century BC. The design was widespread during the 5th century too. The fragments confirm what they saw on the monitor. The amphoras are all the same type. This does appear to be a commercial consignment of Etruscan amphoras dating back some 2,600 years. The size of the cargo and the fact it is all the same make this a major discovery. On the other hand, he doesn't know what these are. They look like weighing scale bowls or vase bottoms. They're very, very fine, either copper or bronze. It looks like a consignment of thin vases, but he doesn't really know. They'll have to soak them in fresh water and clean them to see properly. It proves to be a stopper. It's preserved perfectly intact and thick. It's made of cork. The cork stoppers are a unique find. Traces of pitch enable Luke to identify the pot's contents. Wine. Alcohol appears to have been a mainstay of Etruscan culture, but first-hand accounts are sadly lacking. Fragments of history may lie inside each amphora. Wine was one of the principal products carried by the coastal traders. The fragile pots must be handled with care. If it were legal to sell them on the open market, each would be worth between five and ten thousand pounds, making them highly attractive to underwater thieves. For their pains, Luke and his team now know that in a small area they have already found at least one layer of 70 5th century Etruscan amphoras. The cork stopper has enabled them to identify the contents as wine. The fact that they have found only Etruscan remains is promising, but the unexpected number of containers provides a problem. How do they tackle such a major find in the few days that remain? Can Luke dare to hope that they've stumbled on the first wreck of a large Etruscan vessel ever found? Off the coast of the south of France, an Etruscan wreck yields its hoard of wine jugs from the 5th century BC. For underwater archaeologist Luc Long, every new amphora confirms the exceptional scale of the find and the practical difficulties he faces. The two-week loan of the boat and equipment is running out fast. There's not enough time to raise everything below. Luc must maximize the few days remaining. Estimates of the freight's numbers have already doubled to almost 150 amphoras. A wreck such as this, untouched by looters, has never been found before. The divers keep working in the hope of finding a piece that could tie down the precise period. They hope for a datable style or a signature.
Luke can make out a mark made by a sailor. It's a letter. On investigation, it turns out to be a cross, a letter in the form of a cross, whose pronunciation is unknown. They really need to consult a specialist in Etruscan writing who could enlighten them. But for the moment, only Luke's electric magnifying glass sheds any light. The Etruscan language bears no resemblance to other ancient tongues. They began to write only at the beginning of the 7th century BC. They borrowed the Greek alphabet, but inscribed it from right to left. Some short inscriptions can be deciphered, often proper names, which appear to indicate the owner of an object. But longer texts cannot be understood. They remain enigmatic. Hello, Luke. On y va. OK. Oh. Luke is now grappling with a crucial question. Is there anything below the first layer of amphoras? He and Henri Delos swap notes. Henri is a major industrialist with an interest in archaeology. He believes that if there were only one layer of amphoras, it would have sunk much deeper into the soft mud. Henri says they'll have to be like surgeons and probe a small area. They need to select one area and open it up. Luke is concerned they don't have time to do that. Time is tight. They mustn't uncover too much. It's better to collect what they can. At the same time, they have to know what's inside the wreck. Henri decides they need to use the microblaster to probe the area of the copper and bronze they found and use the big blaster on the rest of the amphoras. Luke decides to limit the probe to where they found the marked cup and the strange bronze objects. Perhaps this is where the crew had their quarters. Luke has to rely on luck as well as skill. He's only got one chance. It's a lottery. The archaeologists' dreams more than come true. From beneath the silt appear three new layers of amphoras, perfectly laid out. Quite soon, it dawns on the team that they are uncovering the largest ancient shipwreck ever located. The scale of the find raises a host of fresh questions. Could the ship itself still be intact beneath the amphoras? Which port did it set sail from? Where was such a vast cargo heading? For whom was the delivery intended? Henri makes one final discovery. Luke is pleased because the find is an ascos, a vase for holding oil or perfume dating from the very early 5th century. This design appeared around the beginning of the 5th century, glorifying Athens. But the decoration, the black figure, belongs to the 6th century. Two people resting. It's a very pretty vase, even if, unfortunately, its handle is broken off. The diving expedition is over. Luke and the team have a major find on their hands with over 50 intact wine jars. They're in a hurry to research the implications of what they've found. Luke at once sets about the complex task of analyzing the objects they've recovered. He's determined to find out what happened to the boat.
books alone can't tell him what he needs to know. Luke has concentrated on the Ascos, the little vase with two athletes. Among pictures of the statues in Italy, he's found a young man who also has his legs crossed. He's found similar Greek designs, but the position of the arms is not the same. He's found a statue in Servateri, a former Etruscan city in Italy, which is exactly alike. The right arm is placed on the thigh, exactly the same as with the other person. He's been struggling with it for a while, the cushion and the folded arm, and thinks there must be a connection, a real link between the design on the vase and the city of Cairi Servateri with its statue. Luke can't get any further without visiting the likely source of the amphoras. An analysis of the clay used to make the pots confirms what the little vase suggests. They were probably produced in the Pyrgi region. In the 6th century BC, Pyrgi in southern Etruria, now Tuscany, was the port for the great Etruscan city of Cairo, itself as large as Corinth or Athens. Today, Pirgi is the small Italian town of Servateri. Excavations are already underway under Professor Giovanni Colonna, a leading Etruscan specialist. Luke hopes to put to the professor his belief that he has found a large ship carrying wine from just this area. Luke assures Professor Colonna that all the amphoras are of the same type. He learns that this goes against the traditional assumption that traders carried mixed cargoes along the coast. He also confirms that there isn't a single Greek amphora among them. Professor Colonna says it's very important because the discovery of the wreck of a Greek boat led to the theory of mixed loads. Now they know that they should not exclude the possibility that there were direct sales, particularly of Etruscan wines. One of the favorite wines of the time came from Cairo Servateri. It was considered a drink for the elite. It was only produced in limited quantities, but it was a very refined wine. Just a few meters away, stone blocks reveal the site of the ancient port. An Etruscan ship laden with Cairi wine cast off to leave tantalizing clues off France. Luke has brought the only inscription found so far for Professor Colonna to identify. Only one person has given him a possible solution. Greek letters going from right to left. A pi, alpha, gamma, omicron, and possibly a sigma. P-A-G-R-O-S. Pagros. The fish called pagros in Latin rather like a sea bream, a fish with a very flat and sloping head. The idea is that the letter's form gives the shape of the fish, and the letter O acts as an eye. Colonna is not convinced. Luke is left to conclude that the design is keeping its secret. In the neighboring workshops, objects found on the site are cleaned and examined. In the 6th century BC, this region of southern Etruria was at its height. Many archaeological artifacts and relics have been found whose roles remain unclear today. Together, they give tantalizing glimpses of the presence of people who were cultivated and cultured. The objects themselves betray a subtle blend of many different influences. They're evidence of an original culture open to East and West and a host of fruitful exchanges. Even today, some of the skills used in making gold miniatures cannot be matched.
the objects increased Luke's curiosity to know more about the seafarers. A nearby village of their tombs may give him further inspiration. In his mind are other questions. Were the Etruscans from Cairo exporting wine wholesale? How big was their boat? Are there clues here to the riddle of the unknown race? For French underwater archaeologist Luc Long, this is the latest step in his quest to discover the source of the wreck he's investigating off the Côte d'Azur the largest antique wreck yet found. Now he's searching among a thousand acres of tombs in Tuscany. Long before the Romans, their builders, the mysterious Etruscans, dominated Italy and flourished throughout the Mediterranean basin. This was where the people of the town of Cairo honored their dead. Enormous tumuli rise up from the ground, 2,700 years old, sculpted out of volcanic rock. Some of them reach almost 50 meters across. Around them lie more simple graves. Almost uniform in design, these are pointers to the existence of a middle class, merchants made wealthy by trade. For Luke, examining this city of the dead with its streets and squares, is the closest he can come to walking the lost world of the Etruscans. Many of the various influences that inspired the Etruscan city are still visible. Right-angled streets in the style of the Greeks, oriental design cornices decorating the fronts of buildings. The interiors of the tombs show Luke what Etruscan homes looked like, with entrance halls, rooms and corridors. He can clearly identify the characteristics of Roman houses of the future. Below ground is an astonishing insight into the daily life of a wealthy Cairo family. The walls of the tomb are covered in raised plaster models of household possessions and even pets. Other tombs in Tarquinia reveal the ruling class's love of banquets and symposia where people came together to drink wine. The Etruscans love dancing and wrestling, regularly organizing nationwide games. Activities that were previously believed to be Roman in origin can be seen among the Etruscans much earlier. Among them circus games, theater, and chariot racing. Objects found in the tombs, like this terracotta sarcophagus from the end of the 6th century BC, demonstrate how developed Etruscan culture was. In most ancient funeral monuments, the figures are very often set apart. Not here. There are a couple enjoying a banquet. The man looks lovingly at the woman, his right hand on her shoulder. She leans against her companion with confidence and trust. Etruscan woman is shown on the same level as man. It's interesting because it plunges us into an atmosphere totally different to banquet scenes on Greek pottery. Pottery from ancient Athens or Corinth where we can see that, ultimately, the Greek banquet was strictly for men. Greek women were only allowed to take part as musicians or as courtesans.
There is further evidence of the privileged status of women in Etruria in their names. The Etruscans would often add the name of their mother. Men were not just the son of Mr. So-and-so, but also the son of Mrs. Such-and-Such. When a woman not only has a family name, but also an individual identity within the family, she has a privileged status compared to a Greek or Roman woman who would always be anonymous behind her husband and family. Luke now has a clearer picture of a people bridging east and west with their coastal trade. His curiosity and energy are renewed. And although no Etruscan boat has been found before, he has a growing conviction that the wine vessels he has discovered are not a part load, but themselves the major cargo. How many amphoras could be in the consignment, and how were they loaded? As he's found other objects too, were these part of the shipment wedged in among the wine containers? It's time to experiment. After the amphoras have spent a few weeks in fresh water to combat two and a half thousand years of sea salt, Luke prepares to reconstruct the method of loading. Until now, no one had imagined that amphoras could have been stacked one on top of another. It would have big implications for the size of boat necessary to carry such a weight. Luke wants to see how high they can stack them. They fit them together guided by marks of wear. It's a kind of three-dimensional jigsaw puzzle. With five layers, the pots would reach one meter sixty. With the number of amphoras they have per square meter, even with just four layers, Luke concludes the ship would need to be more than 20 meters long to carry a little over 30 tons. So this is already one of the biggest commercial ships from antiquity, over 30 tons, carrying in the region of seven to eight hundred amphoras. The next test is to see how the load was secured. Luke's theory is that the Etruscans used vines because he found many of them among the wreckage and there are signs of rope-like wear. Luke has ascertained there's no way to put either dishes, plates or the bronze bowls between the amphoras. So in fact they were where the divers found them, piled up on top. With barely space to get a hand in, they could not have been wedged in between the amphoras. Their discovery will have to be verified. Is their stacking method a one-off or a tried and tested technique? Certainly there appear to be marks as if twisted vines were used. Perhaps they were tied to form bunches like grapes, or lashed down for stability at sea. In order to be certain, Luke visits the fort stock of Etruscan amphoras from other excavations to see if they bear similar scars. He's certain he can see similar marks on other amphoras. Luke is struck by one pot straight away. It didn't come from his expedition. The researchers have had it for at least 30 years. Lashing the pots together is a system that was widely used. It's not just related to one wreck. Luke has new answers and a fresh puzzle to obsess him.
If he has identified the first large merchant ship of the ancient world, Etruscan, 2,500 years old, carrying 30 tons of cargo, a single batch of 700 pottery jars stacked several layers high, all containing wine, then where was it heading? And who was the shipment for? French archaeologist Luc Long pursues his inquiries. He has assembled enough evidence to suggest that the oldest untouched wreck ever found left Tuscany with a shipload of wine, but what was its destination? The ship left the Etruscan city of Caere's port of Pirgi and sailed west. The location of the wreck and cargo point towards Gaul. Luc goes beyond Marseille to Lat. There, archaeologist Michel P is unearthing the remains of a major port, with many signs the Etruscans were there. Michel tells him the site was originally on the edge of a lagoon, because ships could reach here. Its builders took advantage of the ease of access for ships to develop a major port during the Iron Age. First Etruscans used it, then people from Marseille, then Italians, then Romans. The whole history of Mediterranean commerce is written in the dig here. Luke is anxious to find out if the port was functioning in the late 6th or early 5th century BC and whether Etruscan goods were passing inland. Michel P. is quick to confirm that the time of the wreck was during the period when the site was founded. The port started out on a grand scale. All the ramparts were built at the same time. The town covered several acres right from the beginning, and the impact of this new development on the area inland can be easily traced. The Etruscan amphoras found in this area outnumber those in Marseille or even the local county. This must be due to regular shipments of which the wreck could be one example. Michel shows Luke one of the old entrances, right at the edge of the lagoon. The tree line is where the lagoon was in antiquity. In fact, the area has changed a lot. The port has silted up. At first, the ships would have arrived on a beach before a solid port was set up. So it's a typical example of a harbour where foreign middlemen would come and trade with locals. Excavations here have gone on for many years. Finally, Michel is able to show Luc an area where there were two rooms and a kind of narrow storeroom crammed with broken Etruscan amphoras, about a dozen of them. His impression is that it was a place for selling wine. The digs provide other evidence that Etruscan traders settled in this part of Gaul. In the museum at Lat, Michel points out exhibits with Etruscan markings on them, probably indicating who owned them. Luke wonders, if the markings are in Etruscan, were there people from round here who wrote in Etruscan, or were there really Etruscans here? Michel is almost certain that these are the signatures of people from Etruria who were here. He's convinced that the Etruscans lived here, not just delivering goods, because writing isn't learnt overnight. One crucial point remains to be checked. Are the amphoras from the wreck the same type as those from the Etruscan warehouses in Lat? Ah, voilà. Luke has brought examples from the wreck to compare them with those dug up at Lat. His are complete and heavier. The two men notice that the pottery clay looks quite similar to the naked eye. It's a characteristic dark red-brown colour. They're convinced it's from the same source. Luke is also keen to solve another mystery. Luke has noticed bronze bowls similar to the bowls found on the wreck. Professor Garcia tells him they were used for drinking. 
In fact, they're the equivalent of a wine tasting cup or a drinking cup. The Etruscans drank wine from these, probably passing them round, seeing as they would contain quite a lot. Dominique's conclusion is that the Etruscans not only spread wine throughout southern Gaul, but also how to drink it. The amphora, once it had been emptied, was thrown away. It was disposable. Whereas for the Gauls, the cups were quite clearly prestigious possessions. They aren't found in homes, they're found in tombs, which clearly means that people wanted to be buried with a symbol of access to drink. In reality, not everyone would be entitled to this kind of cup. Luke found about 40 on the ship, for an elite perhaps, or at least for people who knew how to behave like Etruscans. Another similarity between the area around Lat and the wreck. But why was wine so prized by the Gauls? If you look at the overall pattern of imports, they really didn't want much else that the Greeks or Etruscans had. It was really entirely centered around wine and drinking vessels. Uh, before the, the uh, monetization of the economy and the development of uh, uh, paid labor, one of the only ways to really mobilize a large number of people for a specialized task, like building a house or a wall or a road or something like that, was to call people together and offer them a large feast. When one begins to think about alcohol and its role in all of these uh, social and uh, political aspects of life, then one can begin to understand the, the social logic that lies behind this beverage. Uh, the wine probably had a slightly higher alcohol content than the native beers, which means that its, this is, its psychoactive properties would have been augmented in the important uh, intoxicating uh, aspects that are very important, you know, often in rituals. Uh, and there's also the, just the exoticness of the product itself. So the fact that it was a beverage which came from somewhere else in which they had no, uh, no way of knowing how to make themselves. Ten months after beginning his investigation, Luke seizes the chance to return to the wreck. He has to find out whether against all odds after two and a half thousand years, remains of the ship's hull still exist hidden beneath the layers of sand-bound amphoras. The dives begin again in earnest. The atmosphere is tense. The stakes are colossal. No hull of an Etruscan ship has ever been found. For Luke and his team, the mission is clear. First, they must gradually remove the layers of amphora over a small area in order to discover if anything is concealed below. Only when these are cleared away and documented can they open a shaft into the seabed. There proved to be at least four layers of wine containers. If any timbers have been preserved, they could open a whole new chapter in the lost history of the Etruscans. Once more, the blaster aims a precise jet into the mud. On August the 11th, 2001, a rib appears, part of the interior of a hull. There really is a ship there, entombed in the mud 30 fathoms down. The 150 amphoras recovered so far must only be a fraction of the cargo. There are yet more discoveries to be made about Etruscan ship materials and design. A clearer picture is forming. The wreck 
still conceals many secrets. It's a staggering find, a ship of unprecedented size, over 20 meters long and seven meters wide, complete with cargo. And she may provide clues to the mystery of the disappearance of the Etruscans. Had they indeed foreseen that their world would come to an end? They also had a system of recognizing the future of their own society, how long it would last on Earth, by calculating something called secular in Latin, which we might translate as great generations. And the Etruscans thought that for them, there were only a certain number of generations. And when they were gone, there would be no more Etruscans left. And they were right. By the first century BC, at the time of the Roman Emperor Augustus, the Etruscans and their empire had vanished. Yet the wreck must wait a little longer to reveal its last secrets. Its location carefully guarded against pillagers. Luke's search has brought him unexpected answers. He knows that a ship set out from the port of Pyrgi near Caeri, heading for the south of France, perhaps the port of Lat. There it would have landed its cargo, a batch of 700 pottery jars stacked several layers high, containing wine. He knows they're made of Etruscan clay, and the design on a cup on board has given him a name for the wreck, the Pagros. Marks on the amphoras have taught him how Etruscan cargoes were loaded, stacked on themselves. Yet the 30-ton cargo never reached the thirsty Gauls. Luke can finally imagine the last moments of the Pagros. Two and a half thousand years ago, this was the fate of the largest merchant ship of the ancient world ever found. Our World War I season continues on Thursday night at 9 here on 4, focusing on the civilian population in horror on the home front. Even severe